You want to live a life on fire and on mission. You want to be filled with such conviction and drive that you stop caring about what anyone thinks. You want to face each day alive, authentic, and fully present in every moment with your wife, with your kids, on the street, at work. You want to bring yourself to the table and to stop bringing the watered down, nice, what everyone wants version of you. You want that self to be a man who is burning in passion for Jesus, unafraid to bring his kingdom to anyone in your path, no matter what it costs you. You want to love the one in front of you without fear, without needing love back, and without reserve. You want to husband well. You want to father well. You want to shepherd your life well. You want to be a safe pillar for anybody around you. You want to experience God for real, to not just believe, but to know that he's got you and that he'll show up on your behalf, that he'll show up through you. You want to get to the end of your race and say, yep, I gave it everything. Jesus, you know I'm all in. And you want to know just how to get there. Welcome to Man Warrior King. I'm your host, Matt Halleck. Congratulations. You're among the violent taking the kingdom by force. You're among the chosen answering the call to rise above yourself. You're in the forge being stripped down and strengthened, and you will rise stronger, solid, unshakable. You are a man. You're a warrior. You are a king. I want to encourage you to pick up my new book, The DNA of a Man. This book has been selling hundreds and hundreds of copies in the last several months, and it has been revolutionizing the lives of men and even some women alike. I've got messages from guys telling me that they, since reading the book, they have become a more confident and sure and strong husband. Their marriage is getting healed. I've had other guys contact me saying, my marriage has been over, but this book has helped me get back on my feet again. It's helped me realize who I am in Jesus. It's given me hope for a future. I've had other guys contact me having never been married saying, this book is giving me confidence. It's showing me the power of my identity in Jesus. It's reframing how I see myself and how I see the world around me. I want to challenge you. If you need more transformation in your life, please, please, please do yourself a favor and pick up the DNA of a man. It's only $6.90 and and you get the PDF file and the Kindle file and a free bonus teaching as well. You can find it at manwarriorking.com slash DNA. That's manwarriorking.com slash DNA. Thanks, gentlemen. In Exodus, um, chapter 23, or not 23, 33, so one of my favorite, one of my favoriteest chapters in the whole Bible. And this thing has stuck with me day in and day out for the last, I don't know, 10 years or so. Um, to give some context, Moses has been up on Mount Sinai with the Lord. And... He's been receiving the Ten Commandments. He's been talking with God about a bunch of different things. And actually, chapter 32 is kind of where it starts. And that's when the people of Israel make the golden calf while Moses is up on the mountain. And... um. They make this golden calf, which was really stupid, and God gets pretty ticked. It says specifically that his anger is like kindled against his people. All right, so so he tells Moses, hey, you need to go down from here. In, in, chapter, in chapter 32, verse 7, he says, The Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They've made a golden calf for themselves and worshipped it and sacrificed to it. And they've said, These are your gods, O Israel. 
The Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people and behold, it's a stiff necked people. So therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. Interesting how he ends that. We'll get to that in a minute, but this is, this is an interesting thing from the Lord because we, um, we are really, we are his sons, right? We are, we are imitators of him. We represent him. We look like him, all of that. So how can it be that we're supposed to imitate God who seems to be having a bit of a temper tantrum? <laughs> this this display from the Lord doesn't seem to match with the nice guy persona that we feel like we are called to live in because we're Christian men. It doesn't match. So either we are wrong or God was wrong or something like that. So he like, he actually, the way he communicates here is actually kind of distancing himself from his people. He's saying to Moses, go down in verse seven, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. It's like, man, it's like when, if you're married and you're, you're frustrated with one of your kids and you're like, well, your daughter said this today. <laughs> kind of like, I'm not responsible for this thing. And he says, now, therefore, Moses, let me alone. Like, give me space. Leave me alone for a little while so that my wrath can burn hot against them and I may consume them. Guys, I do not want the Man Warrior King movement to raise up a, a, an army of wrathful, vengeful, constantly angry jerks. But there does come a time when anger is okay. And we so, so often try to stay um, placid without anger in so many situations that I think we are actually stepping out of the image of God. Now, obviously he says, be slow to anger. And I, and that's fine. That's great. I get that. And he was very slow to anger with his people all throughout. He's very slow to anger with us, but we are also, we do ourselves a disservice when we try to um, um, tranquilize ourselves. When we're in the middle of a situation that, that warrants some kind of emotional response, that warrants some kind of an anger or an aggression or a, or a fire to burn in us, but we try to keep it from happening. And in trying to keep ourselves placid and peaceful, I would say we become a little bit flaccid, <laughs> weak, lifeless, strengthless, without balls, basically. And so the display from God here is incredible. It's like he's showing himself to be an emotional being. And he displays a spectrum of them. And this isn't the only place he talks about his anger in other places as well. Because what was going on here was he was being disrespected. He was being defamed. He was being adulterated against. And he wasn't going to stand for it. Yet, he was still conducting himself with honor, which he gives us example, which he gives us evidence of that later on. But, and we'll get to that. He was angry. His wrath was burning hot. He needed some time to cool off. So he said, Moses, leave me alone for a little bit. And then he says, 
at the end of verse 10, let me alone so that my wrath might burn hot against them and I might consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. It's very strange. So it seems like what he's saying here is he's saying them, 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 them. But then he's saying, but I want to make a great nation of you, Moses. So it's like, okay, well, if they're going to be done, if they're not in this, I will still be true to my word. I will still be true to my purpose. And I will make a great nation out of you then. Because you're with me, you're faithful. And I'm convinced that if it weren't for Moses interceding, God would have followed through on that. There are plenty of scriptures in the Bible that talk about God looking for somebody to intercede. And he's wanting for somebody to stand up. So God is not letting the people who are coming against him, the people who are betraying him, the people who are um, walking away from him, he's not letting them derail him from his purpose from his mission he's still on mission even in his anger but now here moses says lord why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have actually he moses is saying god you brought them out of the land of egypt with great power and a mighty hand why should you give the egyptians any room to say with evil intent, he brought them out to kill them. So, God, turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. It's really interesting. There's so much here, you guys. There's so much that we can get from the way that God displays himself here and from the way that Moses relates with him. See, we, we wonder why we have a hard time seeing our prayers get answered. But I'm convinced that a lot of that is because we have room to go to get to this level of relationship that Moses had with the Lord, where he can speak with him face to face and he can actually stand up against him. And it's, it's so weird to talk about, but it's in this way that is still honoring. It's honoring the word of God, but it's challenging him. And I'm pretty sure that this is the kind of relationship that God is looking for in us. Because this is where we actually bring a real live human being to the table and we're not just a lifeless, a lifeless robot that will do whatever God says. We're a powerful human who is submitted to God and will obey. But man, we've got thoughts and there's some issues that we have and we need some things clarified here. And I don't like how you're, how you're saying you're going to do things, Lord. So Let's talk about this. So much for us to learn from that. But also so much for us to learn from the Lord in coming alive and allowing ourselves to feel. So kind of to the point that JC brought up, saying, please pray for me and my wife. We need help and counsel. She thinks we're okay. That is just a, just a rough, rough patch. And how do we get help if she doesn't think we need it? Okay. 
And this will apply also, Vince, to where you're at as well. There, we need to grow as men to the point where we feel um, released, we feel confident, we feel okay with the idea of speaking up and standing up. See, God's like, my people are betraying me. That's not okay. And okay, fine, they're out. They want to choose to be out. That's that's the way it is. I'm I'm going to stay on my mission and Moses, I'm going to honor you. Now I I'm I'm suspicious that probably God had in mind to draw Moses into this all along. He wanted Moses to take part in this. Um nonetheless. It's very telling. So in our marriage, there are times when we, we see a thing. And because we've gotten so used to um, just, just always capitulating to our wives because we've believed false things. We've believed that she is our better half. We've believed that she must have more insight than we do. We've believed that if we cause a conflict, if we make her upset, then we are therefore screwing up in the wrong and we've blown it. We have all these perceptions that the presence of conflict must mean that we are wrong. And I promise you there's conflict in this situation and God does not sin. And yet, He's getting stirred up, and he also is stirring things up. But if he hadn't said anything, then the people would have just gone on with their worshiping of the calf. And he's like, well, I, I'm a loving and kind and gracious God, so I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to um, stand up as the head of this relationship, I'm not going to assert myself. I'm not going to assert my conditions for a healthy relationship with me. I'm going to just be quiet, continue to lead them with a pillar of fire and smoke. And I'm going to continue giving manna. And I'm just going to be the nice guy and hope that they come around because they think I'm so amazing. He did not do that, and yet that's what we do. We often see a deep problem, and we let our wives be the indicator the, the thermometer, barometer, whatever you want to call it, the indicator of if and when we should talk about that, if and when we should bring this up. And in so doing, I would suggest that we often allow something like, now I'm not saying what the wife's problem is, is like that they're idolatry or anything like that, but we allow something like a golden calf to just keep on going. And if you're, if you're in a situation where you're not married or whatever, or this doesn't apply in your marriage, this applies to all of life too. There's, there's the very real quote that what is needed for evil to triumph is that good men do nothing. So when we don't, say, hey, you know what? I don't even know if you see this right now, but I am not okay with this thing or that thing. It's not, it's, it's hurting me. And I believe it's, it's going to be hurting our connection and hurting our marriage. And it needs to, we need to figure this out. This thing needs, we need to see it. I need change in this way. 
or if you're seeing if it's something that your wife is doing that you see is clearly not okay there's a place to be like no, that is not good for us. That is going to hurt us and I won't be okay with it. So if we want to take steps forward together, that thing needs to go. And there's all kinds of specifics on how to do that, what kind of conversation to have and everything like that. But we need to draw a line in the sand sometimes because we are not a pushover. God was not a pushover. He still is not a pushover. He says, if you want to come after me, then you what? You must, not an option, you must take up your cross. He's not a pushover. He has standards. If you want to be with me, this is what it takes. As a husband, if you want to be with me and get all of me, this is what it takes. And even if your wife isn't doing a certain thing that's clearly dangerous or a behavior that is threatening to your marriage, but you still have this pain and disconnect that you feel that maybe she doesn't. Then it's, then it becomes a matter of, listen, you know how much I love you. I love you like crazy. And I want so much for our marriage to be good and healthy and whole. And I don't even know if you feel this right now, but I feel this thing. And I'm not necessarily blaming you for it and thinking of myself as a victim, like you're doing this all to me. I think that you have a part to play in it. Yeah, but I think I do too. But I can't, I do not want to let this, this atmosphere, I don't want to let this pattern continue so maybe you don't think you don't feel it you think i'm crazy okay well it's a very important thing to me and i would ask then if you don't feel it that you would at least honor me the fact that i do and be willing to talk about it be willing to consider it be willing to engage on it and if it's serious enough i would really ask that you'd be willing to see a counselor with me so we can work this out. And if you don't, if you don't say yes, that's your choice. I can't force you. Just like God was saying, I'm not going to force the people. He couldn't force them to throw away their calf. That's why he wanted someone to intercede. He wanted it to come from within. He needed a man to stand inside the camp of the people and lead them back it had to the change had to come from within god couldn't force it but he had a standard and by establishing his standard he forced his people to come face to face with their own sin if god had stayed silent silent their sin would have continued but because he laid down the law it forced the people to choose are we going to continue with the calf or are we going to repent and get back into relationship? And sometimes that is what our marriage needs. It needs for us to rescue it by laying down a standard because then what happens is it forces the other, our wife to come face to face with what she needs to reckon with. Instead of us just being quiet and hoping it's all going to magically happen and trying to secretly manipulate things to work out the way we want them to, instead of just being open and laying things out on the table. So it forced Moses to enter into that place of intercession where he says, what are you guys doing and they're like, oh, my goodness, what have we done? So there's absolutely, absolutely place there for us to, it, it, unfortunately, gentlemen, it requires balls. <laughs> It requires some balls. 
it requires us guys and i'm not i'm i'm not speaking down to anybody i'm thinking i'm remembering times in my marriage where i've been like heart beating fast in my chest and like breathing like intensely like oh, thinking about i'm about to walk in and start this conversation and it requires courage but i would like to suggest that in those moments your wife is not goliath even though it might seem like it when you have to have that conversation i think all this inner crap all this lack of confidence all this feeling like we can't speak up all this lack of worth all of this disconnect in the marriage itself yeah that could be goliath but she herself is not she's still a daughter of god is she messing up maybe is she doing a lot to mess up is she hurting you is she spiteful is she all those things maybe but if you can learn as you step out to engage in this conflict if you can learn to stand strong as a strong tower like god is our strong tower if you can stand as a strong tower and have your eyes fixed on the enemy that's out there, then you can weather when she comes and throws a fit and beats her hands on the side of the tower because you're not going to crumble. It's just like God didn't crumble. So, JC, I hope that that gives you a little bit of something to work with, something to think about in your situation there. Um, and same with you, Vince, if that helps you as well, gets get some gears turning for you. So good, JC, I see that. Cool, good. So as we keep going in this chapter, in this story, there's a couple interesting things here that just that just fly under the radar sometimes. And I'll talk about that in a bit. But in chapter 32, verse 15, it starts out, it says that Moses goes down from the mountain after the, God relented from what he was gonna from what he was gonna do. It says that God relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on the people. Okay. Because Moses said, Hey, don't do that. What about your name? What about your honor? What about the word that you promised? Don't do this. So God relents and he goes down. Moses goes down from the mountain with the two tablets of testimony in his hand. And it says the tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God. So Moses is carrying the pieces of stone that God himself wrote on. I mean, this is like the Bible on steroids, right? God reached out, touched the rocks, and engraved them. Okay? And it says, When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, There's a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It's not the sound of war, but it's the sound of singing that I hear. So this is interesting. Well, no one ever really realizes this. Maybe, I don't know, maybe we do. We just don't talk about it much. But Joshua was actually with Moses while he was receiving all of this. We think Moses was there, but he wasn't by himself. Joshua was with him. Because clearly Joshua had no idea what the noise was. He's like, wait, it's not the sound of war. That's weird. It sounds like singing. So that's really important to know about Joshua because we see him show up again in the next chapter. So Moses and Joshua come down from the mountain and he, it says, um, Verse 19, as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. This is insane. First of all, 
God, our head, the husband, he gets angry. He expresses that. He lays down his standard. Now Moses, an imitator of God, a son of God, the head of the people, like a husband, just as God is also like a husband, he gets pissed off and angry. So much so, he throws down the tablets that God has touched and breaks them. Guys, I'm not suggesting that you go out and do something quite that rash and stupid, but there's a crazy sign here that there's room for us to come alive a little bit more, to live a little bit more unleashed, to be a little bit more edgy and offensive because God didn't strike Moses dead right then. He didn't say, oh my gosh, Moses, did, what did you just do? Did you just, did you just crush my handwriting? Do you know how holy I am? God didn't get offended at this. See, God, it's this weird thing. God's angry at the people, but he's also not getting offended. And there's a really big difference between the two. But that also speaks about Moses. Moses knew the Lord to the point where he lost his temper. He threw down the tablets and God didn't cut him off. God continued to engage with him. And in fact, he even honored him even more in the next chapter 33 when he shows him his glory. So I don't know, guys, I don't know the formula. I don't know the, the black and white of, okay, this is the line that you can cross. But if you cross the next line, that's too far. I don't know what that is. But I just know that God and us, he has room for us to be fiery and alive and passionate with him. For me, one difference between being offended and being angry is when when we start to entertain these thoughts of like, oh, she always does this. She's this way or that way. And, um, it, and how could she do this to me? If only she would stop, then I'd be okay. It's like this it, offense kind of takes on this victim approach where now I'm a victim of who's offending me. Whereas anger, I'm not a victim I'm trying I'm I'm actually trying to take ownership of the situation. Right? I feel like God wasn't making himself the victim of the people. Um he was still in taking ownership of it. Yeah. So that's thanks for contributing that Scott. That was a good point. That offense is kind of that line. Yeah. Um at least one of them is good. So so they're coming down from the mountain. They, uh, Moses throws it all down. Um, and the sin is exposed. Right? He says, it says in verse 25 of chapter 32, and Moses well, saw no. that the people had broken loose. <laughs> What's that? Oh, maybe they're not talking to me. No, oh, it says when Moses had saw that the people had broken Oops. loose to the derision of their enemies, um, he stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. So he's, he's literally, I'd actually forgotten that this part happens. He's literally drawing the line in the sand. Like all of this, this manly masculine confrontation is literally right here leading to this line drawn in the sand. Are you with me or are you not? Whoever is, come. Whoever's not, okay. And we have, to, we have to learn to engage, especially in our marriages, with that kind of an approach. I cannot force you to do anything, but I will force that you come face to face with where we're at. And it's up to you what you're going to do with it. Now, yeah, you've got to choose me or you got to not. 
And it doesn't mean that we're perfect. It doesn't mean that we're all right and they're not. But it does mean that this dynamic is at play. I need to be real about what's going on inside of me so that you can know all of me. You can know the true me and you can be forced to decide, do you want me or do you not? I've always thought this about Jesus. I want it. I don't care if people don't accept him or not when I pray for them to be healed or when I preach something to them. I don't care if they accept him or not. I just want them to know the real him and decide whether they're going to go with him or not. I don't want them to get some fake version of him that I'm trying to package nicely. I don't want them to get some religious form of him. I want them to have met him. And if they're still going to reject him, at least they know who they're rejecting. And it's similar with when we're trying to come together with our wives. Okay, so... In the last part of this chapter 32, it says that Moses said to the people, you've sinned a great sin. And I'm going to go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So he returns to the Lord and says, this people has sinned a great sin. They've made for themselves gods of gold. But now if you'll forgive their sin. Okay. But if not, please, if you won't forgive their sin, please blot me out of your book that you've written. Like, God, if you're not going to forgive them, then I don't want to be with you. (laughs) Because Moses was expressing a similar sentiment, a similar quality, a similar character as God himself. This is my line, God. Are you going to be the one you say you are and forgive? If not, then, then, then erase me from your book. What, what freaking audacity and boldness does it take to communicate that way with God? And it takes trust. To trust that God will hear me. And to trust that I've built something with him that can stand that kind of a conflict. And God sends a plague on the people. Um, He does say he'll forgive those who return to him and all that. But then he says in chapter 33, depart, go up from here. You and the people who who you brought up to land that I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will send an angel before you and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites. I'll drive out all these people. You'll go to a land flowing with milk and honey. But God says, but I will not go among you because if I do, I might consume you on the way because you're a stiff necked people. So this is what God's saying. I'm going to treat you with honor in my anger, in your offense against me. I will still be true to my word. This is our goal as men. When things go against us, We need to still be true to our principles, to who we are. We need to be men of principle, regardless of what others are doing. So he's saying, I will fulfill my word. I will give you what I promised. I will honor you, but I will not go with you. Because you have cut off communion with me. You do not get the intimacy of my presence. And the people mourned. And God said to Moses, say to these people, if for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. (laughs) So he is still, his anger is still here. That said that he has relented from his wrath and that, you know, he's going to forgive those who come to him and all that, but he's still angry. So there's this weird place of like, man, is it, is it, is there a place for me to have anger and not sin? Is there a place for me to have anger without it being wrathful? And to be honoring in my anger. And I'm not giving you the playbook on how to do this perfectly because it's difficult. And yet that seems to be clear here. And now Moses 
this is where we need to get with the Lord, you guys. Moses, in verse 7 of chapter 33, he used to take the tent and pitch it outside of the camp, far from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. Everyone who sought the Lord would go out there. Whenever Moses went, all the people would rise up and each of them would stand at their own tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. And when Moses entered, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance. And the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing there, the people would rise up and worship each at their own tent. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And then this is where Joshua shows up again. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, he would not leave. This, I believe, is exactly why Joshua was Moses' predecessor, not predecessor, his successor. Because Joshua understood what it meant to seek God's presence. He was with Moses on the mountain, and even when Moses would leave this tent of meeting, Joshua would stay. He was like, that's not enough for me. I want more. See, there's tenacity and audacity even in that. I'm not going to follow my leader when he says he's had enough with the Lord. I need more. He takes charge. He takes ownership. There's gumption there. And it's gumption for the right thing, which is God's presence. But do you see in all of this, guys, in all of this, in Moses arguing with God, in, with Moses throwing down the tablets, God honors him more than anybody else. And it says he would descend and be there and speak with Moses face to face like a man speaks with his friend. That's incredible. And it didn't become, it didn't come because Moses just dotted all his I's and checked all his check boxes. He didn't have all the Sunday school answers. Moses was real. And so Moses persists and continues to intercede. And God finally, finally says in verse 14, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. See, there's these two very masculine beings at, at work here. God a- acting in his masculinity, Moses ask, acting in his. And there's conflict and yet there's resolution. There's anger and yet there's intimacy. And it even goes on where God then passes his glory by Moses and just reveals himself to him in a brand new way. So you guys, there's, man, I feel like there's so much in this story. For those of us who are needing to learn to to stand up more, to act with manly strength and assertion and and almost put our foot down in a, in a way, and say, no, this will not be okay. I need to speak up. There's that. But then there's also this, this relationship that we see here with the Lord and Moses where, where he got to know him really, really well. And the only way that they got to a greater place of intimacy was when Moses was also putting his foot down with God and saying, no, stop it. And it's crazy, but God honors it with even more intimacy. And you guys, we get there 
Practically, we get there as we make it a priority and a habit to continue to seek God's face, just like Joshua. When it says, when Moses would leave, Joshua would not. That would means it was a continual thing. It happened many times. This was Joshua's practice, his habit. He would not leave the tent of meeting. So what are we willing to sacrifice to get to this place with the Lord? Because you guys, if we can get to this place, I'm convinced that we're going to become more like him. He's going to shape us to be like him so that we can actually learn to have anger in a right way, not abuse it, not go overboard, not become a jerk, but to also learn how to assert and to have these hard con conversations, to have confrontation. As we spend time with him, we will become like him. So it takes for us this sacrifice of our time and our energy to say, you know what? I could be sleeping right now, but I'm not going to. I'm going to go to the tent of meeting. I'm going to stay up later and sacrifice sleep to be with the Lord. Jesus did this. He stayed up all night at times, or he would rise up early in the morning to go to a place and pray. Or I could, um, you know, if you're, if you're married or whatever, like there's an extra level of sacrifice. I could stay in this moment and, you know, hope that sex happens later tonight or, I could take the time and go be with God. I could be spending this time working on this project or that project, or right now I feel like the spirit is calling me. I need to go be with God. And obviously there's time for us to do all those other things as well, but it's, it, there's this heart posture of him first and him only him above all else. Like Joshua had. And yeah, there's a sacrifice in it, but we see it's not really a sacrifice because they get so much more from it. It's not, I have to give up something and have less of it in the long run because I need God. It's like I give up something and I end up getting more of both. That's what happens in the kingdom. We, but we have to step through that 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 threshold and trust that that's going to be what happens on the other side, right? Jesus says, if you want to find your life, you've got to lose it. So we give up those things because we know that in finding God, we also find our life and he's not one who is stingy. He gives good gifts to his children. So we spend that time seeking him, getting to know him. And you guys, it's, it's when we do that and we make a habit of it and it, and it's, it's starting to take hold and be a part of our life and it's flavoring our life. I tell you the, the relationship with the Lord, it, it changes. It's not this like one-sided conversation where it doesn't seem like he's there. Or maybe it does seem like he's there, but it doesn't seem like we ever really go anywhere. It's like, it's like I go through my day and I hear him say what I should do in a situation and I do it. I go through my day and I have a problem and I talk to him about it. And the problem, even if it doesn't get immediately resolved, I don't care about it so much because faith has taken a hold and it's how I see the world through. My perspective changes. Or as these things come up, I'm like, I'm so connected with his heart that I speak, no, that's not okay. And I speak it in the spirit and it's done in the physical. Or, or I say, God, I would really like this. Could you do this for me? And he says, yeah. Right? It's like, it's like let's say you have a, a business partner or a potential business partner. You don't know them at all, but they might end up being your business partner. And they come to you and they say, hey, can I 
have ten thousand dollars to spend on advertising and you're like well we kind of like i just met you you might be my business partner but i don't know we need to build this relationship more first but if it's your best friend from childhood and you've gone through thick and thin together you've had fist fights together because you've been pissed at each other but you've ended up friends even better friends than before and he comes to you and says hey man i need ten thousand dollars because i'm going to on to spend on advertising, you're like, yeah, I'll give it to you because I know you, I trust you. You're my brother. It's the same kind of thing with the Lord. We build this history with him. And then the requests that we have, they fit in a more healthy context. And then, and then we start to realize, Oh, the, the promise that Jesus says where anything I ask you'll do, you actually mean that because for a while, it doesn't seem like you mean that. <laughs> Because I ask a whole lot, nothing happens. But we look at John 15 where he says, if you abide in me, right? This is Moses and Joshua literally abiding in the tent, abiding in the tabernacle. Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. There is, there is a qualification. There is a requirement. And in this place, there's redemption. Did I, did I hear someone unmute yourself? Yeah, if you don't mind. Scott, yeah. Um, can you walk us through, like, how you spend time with the Lord when you spend time with him? Like, kind of like just hearing the voice of the Lord, how that's developed for you. It's a little bit new to me. I've been journaling. and uh, Yeah. I think, I mean, I know I hear the voice of the Lord, but I mean, within the last year or so, really, it's just kind of been something that uh, it's, I believe they give the prophecy to hear the voice of God, you know, it's what it's called, I believe. But um, just kind of walk us through, if you could, like how that looks and how we, that can be developed. Because I don't know, hearing the voice of God in your head is a huge blessing, but it's like, sometimes you're like, am I hearing myself? Am I hearing the Lord? Yeah. You know, and then you're like, kind of psych yourself out something you know what i mean so just maybe walk us through your journey and in, in developing that conversational yeah. intimacy with the lord and so you're referring specifically to that that aspect of actually what it's like to hear god's voice yeah more like, than like have a conversation and yeah. you know how yeah. all that goes for you yeah yeah um i would say that it looks yeah. different from time to time because um and sometimes it looks like like you re referenced, you know, the gift of prophecy, uh, there's, there's prophecy, there's words of knowledge as well. There's, there's kind of different nuanced things there. Right. So there's, there's times of hearing his voice in like a, in like a specific, Oh, I didn't know this on my own. Is that God's not, is that knowledge from God about a certain mm -hmm. situation, you know? So there's that, um, or there's kind of the more ongoing, undercurrent a little bit more nebulous like just just conviction and leading in the spirit by in my spirit by the holy spirit where i'm just like i just know that i know something about my life at the moment okay so that's so it to me it looks differently and and i feel like there's room for that being the case in Acts when it says that the spirit prevented Paul from going to a certain place. Uh, he didn't want him to stop and preach the gospel. I think it was in Asia. Then it says that he tried to go north and the spirit prevented him from going there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and which is very interesting wording. And I don't think that was a vision or a dream because it says right after that, that then Paul had a dream about going to Philippi. So it just seems like the, they would have said it if it was a dream or something like that beforehand. So I feel like there, there's a bit of this, like just knowing that he may have had there. Maybe there was also an inner a dialogue going mm -hmm. on as well. Um, mm -hmm. But either way, there's, there's whatever was going on there. It seems to me like it 
it wasn't the thing we all wish for, which is God to just have an open vision, like slap us on the face. He walks through the, my door right now and starts talking to me. Like we would all love that all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> for real. <laughs> <laughs> we would totally. So, so what I've noticed, and, and sometimes this is within a matter of weeks, I see a shift of me being consistent with the Lord. Sometimes it's like, yeah, there's a shift within a matter of weeks, but really after a few years, I'm like, man, I'm in such a different place than before. What I've noticed is that God seems to put thoughts into my head more obviously than if I'm not taking the time to seek him and tune myself to hear him well. So, so like, so for me, most often, the best I can describe it is thoughts, but that I didn't like generate. Somehow the thoughts just kind of came and and I was observing them rather than creating them. Does that make sense? Maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, and so like for me, the process is a lot like God. Journaling is fantastic, by the way, Scott. Like I, the guys who... I work with, I always provide them a journal, like whether they're mm -hmm. in one-on-one -on -one or it's in the, the ranks of a duel, I'm like, I give them a journal, but it's fantastic. And, and so what I, my input is I'm going to spend time in the word. I'm going to spend time talking to the Lord, but really because I don't want to just be passively observing the word. I want to be engaging with it. I will journal about what I'm reading and I'll journal mm -hmm. whatever I'll say, God, I don't like this. I'll say, God, I feel this way about it. I'll say, God, um, I have questions. I'll say, God, I love this, but it's not true in my life right now. Will you please make this true in me? I'll just journal any of that stuff that comes that's real. Yeah. And usually the journaling just shifts into me just praying. Um, and, and some days my time with him might look a little more like, going to battle and actually like wanting to pray some things into reality, wanting to intercede for people, whatever. Um, but then as, as we go, then I'll be like, you know, Lord, I really, for example, cause it's fresh in my mind. I really want a house. I would love, I really want to buy a house and, and I don't know how to do that, but I need you with me in it, you know, or I need to, I need to know how to do it. And I'll just be, doing that like continually and then on his time and sometimes it's daily sometimes it's not but on his time there will be times where like he hits me and all of a sudden the thoughts in my head start monologuing and it's and it's, it's mm -hmm. from him to me and i'll even like be moved to tears i'll i'll get like just wrecked and i'll have to stay there in it and i can't describe it very well other than the, the other than that mm. and it's still a matter of faith man it really yeah. is because there's no guarantee i'm hearing him i know that's that's why it's hard <laughs> it's super hard and the way but you want to learn how to discern you you start acting on it yeah right so like yeah i went before we moved from california to new york i was praying mm. god should we go or should we not I felt like I heard him say yes after I felt, first of all, I was praying and I felt like he said, I'm not going to tell you for two months. Now you're going to have to wait two months. And that sucked. And I was pissed about it. And I kept on seeking him daily over those two months. Should we go? Should we not? And literally sure enough, it was two months from then he gave me a yes, you need to move. So first of all, just the experience of hearing something and then seeing if it plays out or not, that tra trains mm -hmm. you. Oh, that was him. Yeah. Right. But then after he said yes, I felt like he said, okay. So I just kept saying, God, how do I know this is not just in my head? How do I know I'm, I'm gonna, not going to move across the country because I'm making this up? What if you're not talking to me? And then it was that another moment where those thoughts entered into my head rather than coming from me, where it was like, all right, Matt, I'll give you a sign. 
before the year's over, you guys are going to be pregnant. This at this time we were using birth control and stuff, and like it can take a long time for hormones to get back online. Sure enough, we moved before we got pregnant, but we moved in two months afterwards in July, I think it was. My wife was pregnant, so yes, his word came true in that way. That's cool. Yeah, it was, and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm hearing from God. Yeah. Um, but you know, other times I've been wrong. <laughs> so let me ask you this, because I can hear the voice of the Lord, I think, when I pray now and when I'm seeking his presence, like if I'm listening to worship music, especially or from like genuinely like spending time with him, I feel like I hear pretty well more, more often than not, I would say not like whenever I want, you know, it's like whenever it happens, it can happen when I'm like at work or when I'm in the moment, you know, that's when it's harder to hear. And how do sure. you, in a secular job, you know, and you're not like doing ministry all the time. How do you like right. stay on track with the Lord more often than not and hear the voice of God in the middle of circumstances more often? And I guess it's probably just spending more yeah. time with him outside of work. <laughs> so that you're trained. Yeah, I think that's but, the foundation for sure. That's yeah. definitely like, you can't do it without that foundation for sure. Mm-hmm. But, you're, but you're a teacher, right? So it's like, yeah how am I supposed to be constantly hearing God's voice while I'm up in front leading a class and like talking to the kids and stuff. Right. Um, So I think, yes, one answer to what you're asking there is like, dude, as you make the practice of spending time in God's presence, like there's another place where it says Moses's face glowed after he came down from the mountain that will happen. You may not even start to notice it so much anymore but his, but your your presence glows with his presence first of all okay so that happens when you put in that time on your own like jesus did up on the mountain right mm-hmm. but also uh, you might I, have you ever read the book by brother lawrence called uh, practicing the presence of god no <laughs> you might want to you might want to pick it up it's yeah. it's super old he's like an ancient dude but yeah. he talks about that very thing of like staying engaged with the Lord throughout the day. Um, I have, it's been a long time since I've read it a really long time. I've, I've changed a lot since I read it. So I don't know. I can't tell you with a hundred percent certainty that I would be like a hundred percent on board with it all, but it's worth looking at. Um, but you know, a- I think, go ahead. Another author I heard of, I don't know, John Eldridge, others mentioned A.W. Tozer. Is he one of the ones that was like close to Dude, you have got to read A.W. Tozer. Anybody (laughs) on this call, The Pursuit of God and The Pursuit of Man, fantastic, fantastic books. You've got to read it. Yes, great recommendation. Um. Other, okay, well, we're on it. There's another old school guy who's not alive anymore, Leonard Ravenhill. Um, highly recommend him. He wrote a book called Why Revival Tarries. Just is he English? Yeah, yeah, he is. But okay. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think he moved to America and did a yeah. lot of ministry in America. Um, That's cool. Yeah, cool, so cool, cool. those are great, but... But to get more to your question of like, what about if I'm doing things like, um, so aside from the fact that it's going to naturally just be a part of you more and more, one thing that I feel like, Scott, you probably, I mean, you have done this when you've talked about praying for your students, praying for the people in the, what is it, doctor's office or something like that. Um, or hey, what was that ancient <laughs> old dude? <laughs> Brother Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I bet they, if they're, if they are in the cloud of witnesses that just watch things go on, I bet they laugh when we talk about them. That we crack it up. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. But but Scott, I feel like when you've talked about praying for people, like that's a sign that you're in the zone, man. You're you're in the place of being open to what the Lord wants to do. Maybe it's not uh, specifically yeah. hearing His voice. But you're no, I in think that I do, room. but it's like every other day, you okay. know, it's like so hit or miss for me. And I'm like, I want it every day. So I want to like get in the Lord's presence so that I'm like, every day is a good day. Cause I have good days and bad days. And I'm like, it's like the yeah. bad days are awful. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, so, but, yeah. 
but do, the hunger for that is really good. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have people who are so far along in the Lord who would say the same thing. I want it every day. I want so much more than what I've got. I am so hungry for more than what I am experiencing right now. Like, dude, just listen to Todd White a few times. And he's, mm-hmm. he oozes that. Like, I am so desperate for more. So I think you're on the road to it, you know? Um, yeah. But really, like, if you want to, what I do sometimes is I make it, like, I make an intention of it. And, it, like, before going into a situation, I will say, I will intend, because but when I get in the mode, when I get in the moment, Everything happens. It's hard to focus on that. But Mm -hmm. maybe beforehand, be like, God, what do you want to say to one of my students who's coming into this class right now? You know, and you just like set that stage. Because I think the act of asking the question puts your Mm -hmm. mind in that gear. Then you can be listening. Maybe you'll forget when class goes on and you'll be like, oh, crap. Dang, that sucks. And you try again tomorrow, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But I think being intentional ahead of time or like walking into the grocery store, God, who is it? Mm-mm. Where are you here? Where can I hear you here? You know, just stuff like that. That's really good, Randy. I'm glad you brought all that up because it's so right. Like getting in his word. You're right. It sounds almost boring and archaic or whatever to say that, but it's so important. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. so important to get in his word because yeah, it really does. It like starts to ooze through us and, and all of that, like hard to describe shift within us where, Oh yeah, I am in step with him. I can tell that this is his heart, even if I can't point to exact words like Randy's saying. So yeah, Mm -hmm. it's incredibly powerful. I think that some of the, some of the more ancient like brother Lawrence some of the more ancient Christian mystics had more in this regard than we give them credit for where they have these different practices they would do like being silent before the Lord and stuff like that and you know they would meditate on a single verse just because they wanted to let that seep in and not have their own mental clutter cloud out what God was saying there's a lot to be gleaned from them I believe so This is Matt Halleck signing off and thanking you again for being a part of the Man Warrior King community. If you want more, head over to manwarriorking.com. And please remember to take just a couple seconds to subscribe on iTunes and to leave a five-star rating and a review so that more and more men can join us as we become awesome. You are a kingdom man. Go out, take more ground, push back darkness. Remember you bring value into your home, your work, and your circle. You are not a taker, you are a giver. Abundance is your atmosphere.